starting a brand new section, 2.5. The good news is um, most of the things in 2.5 we've already kind of seen in some capacity already this year, uh, but this is a, kind of dedicating the section to it. We're going to be building functions from other functions. How do you do that? Let's say you have two functions. You can create a brand new function from those two functions by combining them. How? No, we're not finding where they intersect. We want to create a brand new function from two existing functions. We can add them together. We can subtract, subtract one from the other. We can multiply them together. We can divide one by the other. And we can also plug one of them into the other. Yeah, that's composition. Okay, so um, let's look at example one. Okay, example one. Let's say, and you're going to have to use your imagination for this, right, that you are in the market for a very special type of blanket, okay? That's already going out on the limb because some of you all have no interest in purchasing a blanket, right? But let's pretend that you are interested in purchasing a blanket, but you're not, you're not interested in necessarily keeping warm with that blanket. No, you're, you're into the blanket because you like what's on it. And so you're in the market for a, an elephant blanket. Huh? A two-sided elephant blanket. Ah, even more. So uh, you find one finally, because they don't—they're they're not all over the place, believe it or not. You can't just walk into the Target and go to the elephant blanket aisle, right, and then choose from thousands. Thank you of elephant blankets on the shelf. But let's say you—you're you're like in some small, quaint town, and you're traveling through one of the little boutiques, and you see the elephant blanket. There it is. You've been looking for it. Um, it says for the ride on the spaceship. What does that mean? I guess I say something about a uh, spaceship up here. Anyway, um, it, it's it's a hundred dollars. The blanket's a hundred dollars, and you are totally willing to pay that because you've been searching for this perfect blanket for a long time. Now, the elephant blanket proprietor, the owner of the store, um, has had that blanket on the shelf for like a hundred years, trying to get rid of it. So offers you a deal, offers you a deal. He's never sold one before. It's his only blanket. He offers you both $10 off and a 10% discount on the blanket. But being bad at math, the elephant blanket proprietor lets you choose the order in which you would like to take those two discounts, $10 off or 10% off. You being an astute math person and in the interest of saving money on your lucky find, does it matter the order in which you take the, uh, the discounts? It does, right? If you would like to save money, you should take which one first? The 10% the or the $10 off? Why the 10%? Yeah, because you're taking 10% off of a bigger amount, right? And you know how percentages work. That was one of the cruxes of the debate last night when they were talking about the tax code. Did, you, did anyone see the Republican debate? Uh, someone said that somebody is going to have fewer uh, fewer dollars as a tax break, but uh, it was pointed out that percentages don't work that way, right? If you have more money, you pay more taxes. If you have less money, you pay fewer taxes. So anyway, kind of interesting. But, yeah, you would take the 10% uh, discount first and then take $10 off of that. So that right there is basically composition of two functions, and I'm going to show you what this would look like mathematically. So. If we let P be the purchase price, and we let D of P be uh, the final price using the 10% discount alone, and T of P uh, being the uh, price for the $10 off, let's write an equation for the final cost, C1 and C2, uh, if both discounts are used. So let's, let's go ahead and write the function for D of P. This would be the 10% off price. How are we going to determine what the final price is if we take the 10% off of the purchase price P? Well, how, did you, how would you determine the cost? If it's 10% off, what would you do? How would you determine the price? What's that? So the original price minus 0. What would you say, 1 times that? We're using P for price? Yeah, that makes sense, right? You multiply the price by 0.1 to get the discount amount, 
and then you subtract it from the original price. It's kind of like when you look at your subtotal on a receipt, right? You have your, your final amount and then minus the, the tax amount. Now, notice you could actually do it this way. You could factor a P out, can't you? If you factor a P out, you're left with 1 minus 0 0.1. And, of course, what is 1 minus 0 0.1? 0 0.9. So that's a little bit faster. If you know that it's 10% off, you're going to be paying what percentage of the full price? 90%. So you could actually get the calculation a little bit more quickly and just say, okay, 0.9 times the price. All right, so that's going to be D of P. Now, if I want to take uh, the $10 off, I can write a separate function for that. That would be uh, P of P. And how do I take $10 off the price P? That one's easier, right? P minus 10. Very good. Now, what we're doing here is we're, we're going to compose these two functions. We're going to say uh, the first cost is going to be D of P of P. This is an application of compositions. And the second cost, as a function of the price, is going to be the other way around, T of D of P. Well, it just means the cost, the, co the cost if I take the, the discounts in one order, and C sub 2 would be the cost if I take the discounts in a, in a different order. So this is an application of composite function. Now, if you notice the way I wrote it, and I didn't write it in particular order, but now that I've called C1 D of P of P, C1 would be taking which discount first? The $10 off or the 10% discount? Ah, no, the way I wrote it, remember, we start on the inside when we were using composite functions. So that is P of P on the inside. That would be taking the $10 off first and then taking that and applying the 10% discount next. C of 2, the way I wrote it, C sub 2, is now has the D of P on the inside, so that would be the 10% discount first, and then applying the $10 off to that. So you all are claiming now that C of 2 should be cheaper, yes? All right, let's go ahead and write these two functions. We've done composition already this year. Let's go ahead and come up with a more meaningful equation than for C of P. Some people still have a hard time with comp composite functions, plugging one function into another. They want to multiply it. This does not mean multiplication. So this says you start with your D of P function, which is 0 0.9 times P. And I mentioned earlier in the year that if you replace this P right here with parentheses, now into the parentheses you could plug your other function, T of P, which would be what? P minus 10. Mm -hmm. And if you distribute, you get the first cost would be 0 0.9 P minus what is 10 times 0.9? If I distribute, what's 10 times 0.9? Nine. nine. Very good. So there's a nice cleaned up equation. So that you could you could offer these equations to the elephant blanket proprietor for future use when customers come in. All right, and then the second function is going to be when I take the discount first. So T is on the outside, so I'm going to put equals, instead of P minus 10, I'm going to put parentheses minus 10. And what am I going to plug into the parentheses for this P? I'm going to plug in 0.9P. And, of course, there's really nothing to do to simplify that, so I'll just write it without the parentheses, 0.9P minus 10. And now it's pretty easy to compare the two costs, right? Cost one is taking 90% of the full price and then subtracting what from it? $9. So you're only getting $9 off after the fact. Over here on C2, you're taking the 90% and subtracting $10, right? So you, you, you save, in this case, an extra dollar by using C sub 2, right? And a dollar is a dollar, right? You can use that to go get something off the Wendy's dollar menu or something. Right. Or almost, almost buy a gallon of gasoline with it, right, nowadays. Wow. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out what the actual cost is going to be. Let's go ahead and apply these two functions. What was the original P price of the blanket hanging on the wall? Probably pretty dusty. 100. So just to actually finish the question then, if I plug in 100 for P, what's 0.9 times 100? 90. 
minus nine, that blanket's going to cost me $81. And if I apply the second function, C sub 2 of 100, 0.9 times 100 is $90 minus 10. It's going to cost me $80. Now, that is a little bit over analysis, right? But what it does is it plants the seed for composite functions because we can now ask ourselves this question. Is composition of functions a commutative process? No. We know that addition is commutative, right? 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2. We know multiplication is commutative. 3 times 2 is the same as 2 times 3. Is composition of functions commutative? Yeah. No. Is d of t of p equal to t of d of p? No. Composition in general is not commutative. So the order does matter when you're taking composite functions. Okay. Um, let's go ahead then and get rid of the elephant blanket problem. Not the elephant blanket itself because that can come in handy. Huh? They look like skulls? From far away. They look like skulls. Or if you just zoom out, right? Huh. That reminds me. How would you know if you're looking at a dog, if it's a chihuahua or it's really just a great Dane that's far away? How would you know? Algebra of functions. <laughs> if f and g are functions, then you can combine them in the following ways. Now, notice there's two different ways to make the notation. This is f plus or minus g of x. This is the condensed notation on the left and the expanded notation on the right. You have your condensed notation on the left, and you have your expanded notation on the right. The condensed notation is equivalent to the expanded, but the condensed notation is a little bit u more useful when you're like giving final answer presentations, because right? there's fewer parentheses, it's less cluttered. It's also easier uh, when you're traveling, right? I like to travel, as you can probably tell. You can, you, it's smaller, you can put it in your little fanny pack and travel with it. But the expanded version is better when you're trying to actually use things. So f plus g of x or f minus g of x, well, that's the same as f of x plus g of x or f of x minus g of x. When we write it as f g of x, that's implied to be multiplication. So f g of x is the same as f of x times g of x. f divided by g of x is the same as f of x divided by g of x. Of course, if g of x is 0, we have domain restrictions. Then here's the one that we've already seen this year. If you see fog of x, it's not fog of x, is it? That little O with an open circle means what? Yeah, it means of, right? So it's f of g of x, and it's probably better to write it like this with the g of x physically inside on the right side. All right, so let's try it out very quickly here. Again, this is nothing new to you. You've had an algebra 2, and, of course, we've had two, our first two tests of the year had free response questions that were similar to this. So we should be able to go uh, pretty quickly through here. Let f equal 1 over x minus 3 and g equal the square root of x. Find the domains of f and g and then find these things. Okay, very quickly, what's the domain of f? x can equal 3. Good. We don't actually have to show that anymore. We are setting the denominator not equal to 0. You can just look at it and say, ah, x can't be 3. And what's the domain of g? Or equal to, good, greater than or equal to zero. Nice. Okay, so let's go ahead and find f plus g. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of step up the notation here. I'm going to say that it's f plus g of x, which is the same as f of x plus g of x. They're both the same. And that's going to be 1 over x minus 3 plus the square root of x. All right, now, here's another thing you could do. If you want to give that a new name, f plus g of x could be its new name, but that's kind of a compound name, so you could actually call it h of x if you want because you are creating a brand-new function. So I think I will call all my brand-new functions h of x. Now, let's find the domain of h of x. Is this easier to refer to? What would be the domain of the new function that I created by adding those two together? Right, it still has to be greater than or equal to zero, but now I have to step over three as I go to the right of zero because now it has to work in both terms, right? And we've had this. You have, you have two cases there. 
square root and denominator. So you combine basically the two domains. All right, f minus g. Well, that's going to be very similar, right? Let's call it h of x, and it's going to be 1 over x minus 3 minus the square root of x. That easy. What's the domain of h? Same. Good. The set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 0, and x can equal 3. All right, f, g. What are we doing with f and g? Multiplying them together. Okay, so I know there's probably not a, room, a lot of room here, but we can, we can make it work. We can zoom in. So that's the same as f, g of x, which is the same as f of x times g of x, which I'm going to call h of x. And that's going to be 1 over x minus 3 times the square root of x. Now, on the previous two, I had two terms. I, I didn't get a common denominator, but when I'm multiplying, I think I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to go ahead and just put the square root of x in the numerator and call it that. Is that legal? Yeah, because yeah, the square root of x over 1 can be written that way, and then you can multiply straight across. What's the domain of this new function that I called h? Same? Yeah, it's the same. Set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 0, and x can equal 3. Same. All right, f divided by g. I'm going to skip all the fancy notation. I'm just going to call it h of x equals. And now it's 1 over x minus 3 divided by the square root of x. Oh, boy. Now it's getting more interesting. That is the function right there. But... I might want to simplify it, right? I got a complex fraction. So if you put that over 1, you could do your state change flip. And that would be 1 over the square root of x times x minus 3. Now, when we're finding the domain of this new cleaned up version, can I find the domain of the cleaned up version, or must I look at the original version? Yeah, you have to go back to the original because sometimes when you clean it up, you kind of get rid of some of the problems. Like if there was a hole, you know, you could divide it out, and now you're, you don't have that value uh, to exclude from the domain. So this is a nice version to use, the cleaned up version, but for domain purposes, you've got to go back to the original. So um, I know that I can't divide by zero, and I have a complex fraction. So notice that my denominator in the denominator is 1, that's never 0, and my denominator in the numerator says x can't be 3. So I know still x can't be 3, but I also have another numerator, don't I? Our denominator. I have the square root of x is the big denominator, yeah? So what's the domain of the original function? I'll just leave it to you. You have enough experience finding domain. Set of all x such that, is it still greater than or equal to 0? No, it's just greater. Good, it's just greater than 0, and then exclude 3. Why, why, why can we not include zero now, Telson? Because um, there'll be a zero in the denominator. Very good. In the big denominator, right? This whole thing right here would be zero because you're going to have, if you plugged in a zero, you get one over negative three, which is negative one third, divided by the square root of zero, which is zero. So if you look at the big denominator, which is the square root of x over one, when its numerator is zero, it makes the big denominator zero, so we have to exclude it. Excellent. All right, questions so far? I'm going to do a little notability trick here, talking about condensed form space bags. There it is. All right, so now we're on part E, part T, part E, party. We're on party. Party. We're going to call it H of X. G of X now is the square root of X all over 1 over X minus 3. There's the original function. If I were to clean it up, state change flip, it would be what? Um, square root of x over. Over? Would it be over? Um, yeah. Over? Well, here's your main division bar. So multiplying or dividing by 1 over x minus 3 is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal, x minus 3 over 1. That would end up putting it in the numerator. Yes? Okay, now that's the cleaned up version, but when we're finding the domain, we have to go back to the original. Now notice 
we still have to consider the radical. Can we include zero or not in this problem? We can, because the square root of x is in the numerator. Now, if you take the derivative of the clean, or if you, not the derivative, sorry, if you look at the domain, another D word, of the cleaned up version, you'd be done, right? You'd say x has to be greater than or equal to zero. But that's not how it started, because we had a complex fraction, and we still need to avoid division by zero. Well, the numerator in the big denominator is one. It's never zero. But in the small denominator, we have x minus three. So we still need to exclude the three, because it makes the denominator, the big denominator, undefined. So you look at your big denominators, which is the thing I circled in red, and you look at your miniature denominators, which I'll circle in green. So notice, if you were to clean this up, you might want to put that little disclaimer there. Hey, you can use the square root of x times x minus 3, but don't use 3, even though the cleaned up version allows it. Thank you. Okay, uh, part F. How do we read that? F of G of X. So if you write that in the expanded form, it looks like that. And I'm going to call that H of X. So now we're plugging G of X. We can clearly see into F. We're plugging G into F. So F is 1 over blob minus 3. And in place of the parentheses, we're plugging the square root of X. So again, this is not multiplication. So if you can go straight to the purple line without the parentheses, that's fine. But again, what I did is I took my function f over here, and I replaced x with parentheses, step one. And then I come back in place of the parentheses and put g of x. Now let's find the domain, the domain of our new function h. Well, I still have a radical, yeah? So I know that x has to be greater than 0. What about equal to 0? Because it's in the denominator, you say no? Um, you right. You do the two-part thing, but notice if I take the square root of zero, that's not what the entire denominator is, right? If it were just the square root of x, then I couldn't include zero. I have a little helper number down here. So let's, if you're in doubt whether or not to include zero, just plug it in and see if it works, right? What do I get when I plug in a zero for x? I get the square root of zero, which is zero. And 0 minus 3 is negative 3. Does that work? Heck, yeah, it works. So can we include 0? Yes. But now I take the whole denominator, which is case 2, and now I'll say that the whole denominator shall not, cannot be 0. And then I add 3 to both sides, and I square both sides, and I get x cannot be 9. Now, remember, when you square both sides, it should send off a little bell or raise a what? A red flag because you need to check for extraneous solution. Does 9 actually work or not? Let's see. When you plug a 9 back in for x, square root of 9 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. He does cause a 0, so we do need to exclude him. All right, so the domain is everything greater than or equal to 0, but, hey, when you get to 9, just don't use him. Okay? Step over him. All right, g of f of x, this is composing it the other way. That's the same as g of f of x, that's the expanded version. So we're taking the square root of x, which I'm going to just put parentheses, in a place of x, now we're putting 1 over x minus 3. And I'll call that h of x. All right, now if I simplify that, that's going to be kind of interesting. Make the radical a little bit taller. That's kind of what I start with. Now, if I simplify that, I have the square root of a quotient. We talked about this property earlier in the year. You could take, then, the square root of each the numerator and denominator. Each factor, essentially, can get its own radical. And what becomes of the numerator, then? What's the square root of 1? 1. One. Nice all over x minus 3. Now, the x minus 3, the whole thing is under the radical, yes? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so now we need to find the domain. That's the, probably the cleaned up version that we'll stick with. So now the domain of H. Well, I can't really go back to that cleaned up version. I've got to go back up here. Now, what value do we know for sure is going to cause a zero in the denominator? Three. So we know three is off limits. But I also know that I can only take the square root of what types of numbers? Positive. How am I going to know my radicand, right, is 1 over x minus 3? I need to know now for what values of x is 1 over x minus 3 greater than or equal to 0. How am I going to solve that? Is that a linear inequality? No. So I can't solve it algebraically. I guess I have to try to solve it how? Graphically. Do I know what the graph of that looks like? Sure. That's an easy transformation of one of our parent functions, right? That moves our reciprocal function three units to the right. So, and it looks like that and looks like that. For what values of x now is that graph greater than zero? It's never equal to zero. Where is it greater than zero? Anything less than three? We want it to be greater than zero, so we want it to be above. So everything to the right of three. So for all x greater than three. Yes? Okay, so we said that x can't be three because it causes a zero in the denominator. And the radical says that it has to be greater than three. Is three already excluded by the radical's demands? Yes. So you don't need to exclude it again. You'll just say the domain is the set of all x such that x is greater than 3. You don't need to say an x can't be 3. Okay, just say that. Perfect. So this is why now we studied parent function transformations before we got to this section, because if you're setting up an inequality from the original setup, you can't necessarily always do it from the cleaned up version. Sometimes the cleaned up domain is the same as the original domain, but not always. In this case, it would come out to be the same. Yes. Uh huh. So when you have a radicand that is not linear, you're going to have to solve it graphically. It's the quickest way to do it. All right, f of f. Can you plug a function into itself? Sure can. That's f of f of x. I'm going to call that h of x. And let's make sure we get the right function. f is 1 over input minus 3. That's going to be 1 over input minus 3. And what am I plugging in to this, the parentheses? 1 over, x. 1 over x minus 3. Wow. All right, let's go ahead and find the domain first because uh, it might save us the temptation of finding the domain of our cleaned up version, which we will also do. Okay, so... I don't see any radicals. That's good, right? So I don't have to worry about uh, saying that it's greater than or equal to zero. But I do have a couple of denominators. The easiest denominator is the miniature denominator, right? So I know that x can equal 3. Agreed? But I also have the larger denominator. The other denominator is 1 over x minus 3 minus 3. And I know that that can't be zero. How am I going to figure out what value, if any, makes that zero? Mm. Is there a value that makes that zero? Can we graph that one? Hello, welcome. How are you? You're good? Everything's okay? Yeah. Yeah? Awesome. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and sketch it. The minus 3 in the bottom moves the graph what? In the bottom with the x. Moves it right 3. The minus 3 off to the side moves it down 3. So, And we know that it opens essentially in the same quadrants 1 and 4. Is that graph ever equal to 0? That graph never, whoa, that graph never crosses the x-axis? Yeah, I spy it right there. I need to find out what that value is and eliminate it from the domain. Okay, so now, because it's not an inequality, can I solve that equation or unequation algebraically? 
Yes, it's only the inequalities that you cannot solve algebraically. All right, so what I think I'll do is I'll bring the uh, 3 across, make it positive, and now you can cross multiply and you get uh, 3 times the quantity x minus 3. Yes, cross multiply. And you get 1 cannot equal 3x minus 9. So then you get add 9 to both sides, you get 10 cannot equal 3x, and you get x cannot equal 10 thirds. 10 thirds would be the x-intercept of that graph. So how many values do we need to omit? Just two. There's only two values that cause zeros in two different places. So because there's no inequalities, again, we don't have to worry about the uh, whole avoiding negative numbers. So x can equal 3 and 10 thirds. Instead of all x, such that x cannot equal 3 and x cannot equal 10 thirds. Those are pretty close together, huh? Yeah. Okay, so now that we got that figured out, let's go ahead and simplify it, because I don't really like this version. It doesn't look so pretty. Would you agree? Yeah. All right, so now I need room to work. So here's where uh, we go with the space bag effect again. And you can add pages, right? You all know how to add pages above or below? Maybe I need to revamp these notes so there's more room to work. Uh, let me get rid of all of this and just shrink it down, keep it here. All right, so now that we already found the domain, now we can go ahead and simplify uh, with confidence. I have a complex fraction, and since I have two terms in the bottom, I can't do state change flip, right? It only works when you have a single factor in the bottom or single term. Um, but I do have a complex fraction, and I've taught you all how to clean that up very, very quickly, right? Just multiply by a clever form of one. That is the conjugate. Not the conjugate here. That's when you're trying to rationalize, when you have like a radical with two terms. If you have a complex fraction, you multiply by the least common multiple or denominator over the least common denominator of your miniature denominators. Well, we only have one miniature denominator, right? And it's x minus 3. So we multiply by x minus 3 over x minus 3. It would be kind of the same idea as if you were trying to get a common denominator in the denominator. You would need to multiply the 3 in the bottom by x minus 3 over x minus 3. But it's quicker if you do it this way. So in the top, if you multiply straight across, you get x minus 3. Now in the bottom, look what happens. When I distribute the quantity x minus 3 to the first term in the denominator, I get 1 over x minus 3 times x minus 3. What happens with your x minus 3s? They divide out. They divide out <laughs> leaving you a what? One. They divide out to give you 1. Minus the 3 times that is just this. That takes care of the complex fraction in one simple step, LCM over LCM. Now in the denominator, since it's partially factored, I'll go ahead and expand it out. 1 minus 3x plus 9. And I can rewrite that now as negative 3x plus 10. There's the cleaned up version of our function. But remember, what values are off limits? 3 and Ten thirds. Now notice if you were to clean it up first and then find the domain, would you get the same two values as restrictions? Yeah. You would? No. I don't think so. I think you have just one denominator now, right? And if you set negative 3x plus 10 not equal to 0 and solve, guess which value you would get? You would still get x can't be 10 thirds, but you wouldn't get x can't equal 3. In fact, 3 works, right? 3 would give you a 0 in the numerator instead of the denominator. So that's why it's important to find the domain as soon as you set it up. Or if you're going to simplify first, go back to the original to find the domain. Because you can change the domain when you simplify. All right. Um, the last one is GOG. That reminds me of a good vocabulary word. A gog. You know that word? Have you heard of that word before? You haven't? Huh? Oh, with an E at the end? Look up a gog. You have, a, you have access to it, right? His amazing feats of mathematics had me a gog. That would be the context. Okay. Now, 
I guess we need to look it up now, right? We can't just say look it up and then go to the math problem. Let's look it up. A gog. Oh, okay, there you go. You did it quickly, quicker than I could. One more, one more time. Very eager or curious to hear or see something. Very curious or eager to see or hear something. His amazing feats of mathematics had me agog. Right? That's what you all say when you see math. You're like, show me more. I am very eager. I am very curious to see and hear more of what you have to say. Very good. Um, so G of G of X, that's what we're calling it. So uh, that would be G of G of X. And I'm going to call that H of X again. So our G function is the square root of X, right? I'm going to put the square root of, and I'll put parentheses there. And in place of the parentheses I'm putting, the square root of X. Oh, sweet. So if I clean that up, I get the square root of the square root of X. That looks like a fortified bomb shelter right there. You think that X is safe? Yeah, double four. Only from a frontal attack, though, right? Someone can easily come in from behind. Hey, tickle, tickle. <laughs> right, not as safe as you thought. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, let's go ahead and find the domain, yeah? Now, notice if we look on the inner radical, because it's the square root, x has to be greater than or equal to zero, yes? But we also need to look at the larger radicand, which is the square root of x, yes? And if I do that, then the square root of x then also has to be greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, yeah? Because there's two radicands. Now, I have set up an inequality. Is, is the square root of x greater than or equal to zero a linear inequality? No. So I have to solve it how? Graphically. We know what the square root of x looks like, right? It looks like this. For what value of x is that graph greater than or equal to zero? All values except the ones that are not, which are... Where are the y values of this graph on or above the y-axis? For all values of x that are greater than or equal to 0. Yeah. When you say everywhere, you mean everywhere in its domain, right? Okay. So, but that's not everywhere, right? It's not to the left of 0, and it's probably not in France. So this is the domain. It works for both of them. So the domain of the function is the set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 0. Now, all we have to do is simplify it. How would you simplify the square root of the square root of x? Is the fourth root of x? Yes, because you can write that as x to the 1 half power raised to the what power? The 1 half. And when you raise a power to a power, what do you do with the exponents? You multiply. So you get x to the 1 fourth, which is the same as the fourth root of x. Nice. Good, and you saw that before putting it in exponent form. Good job. All right. Um, I think that's about all we have time for today. That was that was a pretty big example, example one and two. Um, this section is not entirely that long, so example three, four, five, we might be able to finish Monday for sure on Tuesday. Wednesday we'll review the whole chapter and we'll test Thursday. Okay. No, there's no review. When I say review, we'll just kind of like talk about what the test will look like, and you'll throw questions out, and I'll offer some. Yeah. Where did I get these rimless glasses? Um, I swim the river, so I, I, I find all kinds of glasses, and then I just pop lenses out. Yeah. Mm-hmm.